Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Scott 7 Podcast. Today, we have an exciting show for you today. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, discipleship and teens. And I know um, sometimes that can be tricky with our current culture today. So so Mike and I are going to discuss that. So um, since I've already said his name, Micah, how are you doing today? I'm good. I survived the uh, the time change. I totally okay. forgot about that, by the way. Like, I went to bed Saturday. Alicia and I talked about it Saturday, and then I was like, I guess it's happening. Obviously, it, it is. And then I woke up, and, you know, I never sleep. I don't sleep in. I just can't because, I, you know, I'm always getting up early. And so <laughs> I woke up, and my clock on my phone said 930, and I'm like, it's daylight out. <laughs> like, what, what what's going on? And then I realized suddenly that the, the time had changed. It was it was actually funny. There was a friend of mine because you know people start talking about remember to move your clocks forward, remember to move your clocks forward. And I had a friend go, I find it funny now that people keep telling other people to move your clocks forward when your phone automatically does it for you. And I commented, I go, You mean my rotary phone can change my clocks? Conspiracy. <laughs> and she just about died. <laughs> But you know, but the funny thing is, is everybody still does it. But I always, as a pastor, I've always had times where someone will show up to the church either late, or someone will show up to the church early because they forgot about the time change. And I mean, even if, they, have, if they come early, they could just go grab breakfast or something and come back. Well. I had that. I had a guy who showed up to church, an older gentleman, and and like I'm the only one there. And then he shows up, and I'm like, "Wow, you're here at church early." And he said, "They're talking to me." He goes, "Yeah, where is everybody?" I, and I go, "The time changed. We we moved. Ba- I think we moved back an hour. So, you know, it's now it's actually this time." And he goes, "Oh, I totally <laughs> forgot about that." Well. I'm going to go down to Hardy's and go get some breakfast. So he did. He just left to go get breakfast at Hardy's. Biscuits and gravy and some coffee. That's right. Can't complain about that. But yeah, it was. um, But yeah, those time changes. I just, you know, that was the one thing I loved about Indiana is that they, they they they, they stopped doing that a while ago. Like, so it was always nice because then I didn't have to worry about the time change. And it was great. I thought Ohio passed some sort of law where, like, nationally, Congress or somebody passed a law where they were going to end daylight savings times, but I guess that's not happened yet. No, I know, I know, uh, I know originally it was supposed to be, I think there's a thing going around federal that they're going to do it and just end it for everybody, but then, you know, that hasn't happened. So, you know, it's usually up to the states if they want to make the change they can for their state and then go from yeah. there, but. Well, yep. Oh, well. All right. So before we dive right in, stories gone wild. Do you have a wild story for me, Micah? I do. And and I thought about this on my way, uh, you know, up the stairs this morning, because, you know, I, I always stress about the whole stories gone wild. And yes, I have started a document where I can yeah. keep track of things. Um, but for whatever reason, I haven't updated it in a while. But you had texted me yesterday and said, hey, these are what we're, uh, some topics I'm thinking, but it have to be done because I have to go to the dentist. Yeah. Um, I hate the dentist. And yeah. there was a um, conference that I was leading worship at years ago. And I was in, in Iowa leading worship for a Church of God conference in Iowa. And um, my wife and I, I think we drove there, but we, <clears throat> excuse me, we, uh, we drove there. It was like a two day drive. Cause it, I was a big state, just like Ohio. And so like, it took us a good bit to get there. And so we were there the first night and, um, they fed us dinner and they had salads and the croutons in the salad. So I took a bite down on a crouton and ripped a filling out of one of my teeth. Oh, geez. And I'm, you know, 900 miles from home. I uh, am in the middle of nowhere at this retreat center. 
And so I had to end up going to like an emergency dental place the next day in South Dakota, which was the closest place because we were in the middle of Iowa. And we went in and they were like, you need a root canal. But of course they said, you need a root canal because that's how they say that out there <laughs> instead of root. And to this day, my wife still laughs about that because it's root instead of root. So anyway, they gave me antibiotics. I came home. You know, keep in mind, we have pretty good insurance uh, through the university. And um, we walk into one of these urgent. In South Dakota, they were like, well, we can do the root canal now, or you can just take antibiotics. We'll get you through. And then we'll um, you can follow up with your primary dentist, which at the time we didn't have one. Um, so we took the antibiotics. We drove to... You know, back to Iowa, I did the conference, I drove back to Ohio, and we went into one of these urgent dental care places, and they were like, it's going to be $1,100 for a root canal. And I heard the guy in front of me say that he was going to pay like $1,100, like out of pocket for a root canal. Oh, wow. And I looked at Alicia, I'm like, I'm not doing this. And so I walked out, and she Googled um, dentists close to where we live, and she found the first dentist, and... um Ultimately, we found a dentist. Uh, we love him. And then he ended up saying I needed a filling instead of a root canal. And I was like, oh, great. So uh, they felt the tooth and the tooth ended up failing. And then ultimately, I ended up getting that tooth pulled back in 2018, 2019. And um, the moral of the story is, kids, that when you get a tooth extracted, it's a whole lot cheaper than it is to get a root canal. And there's no guarantee that a root canal works. Um, a, a root canal is like a glorified cavity and they put more filling in there and they put, you know, they can put filling down in the root and it's the name root canal. And um, it can be anywhere from 900 to $1,200, even with insurance. And so when I got my tooth pulled, it was like 80 with local anesthetic. <laughs> it's like, I, I'll pull the tooth and not spend $1,200. So, and you can't even yeah. tell that I, you know, have a tooth pulled. So, um, yeah. And in, in, in respect and celebration of you going to the dentist, that's my uh, story's gone wild. And it has to do with ministry too, because I was on a trip uh, in respect to ministry. Are you just getting a cleaning? It's just a basic cleaning and checkup. Okay. Yeah. You're not getting any like teeth pulled or no. root canals or <laughs> crowns no, or anything no, like that. No, nothing like that. Um, no, but uh, my story's going wild because this weekend we had our musical and it's been interesting because um, the church historically has always done a youth musical. And then when COVID hit, it kind of died. And then there's a member of the church who wanted to revive it. So she did all the rehearsals and stuff. And we ended up doing this show called Celebrate Life, which is actually this year is like the 50th year that celebrate life has been in its existence or whatnot. So it's just chronicles the stories of Jesus. Um, but what was fascinating about this is we're doing this show and these students had only practice rehearsed on Sundays from like mid January to now. So not a lot of practice, like barely 20 practices under the belt to put this show on. So, you know, it was it was good. It was a good show. But the thing that I always find fascinating, I always say this about sound, because with lights, unless the power goes out or there's a squirrel chewing on your wires, your lights are pretty much set. Like, they're not going to change. They're, they're, they're good as gold. But Saturday night, we had our sound guy do everything. And, you know, everything sounded great, sounded perfect. No feedbacks, no... No, nothing. It's really good. Then we get to Sunday. It's always Sunday. And for whatever reason, the board hadn't been touched. No one messed with anything. Nothing. And that sound tech was just constantly moving levers and dials and everything else because it just was feedbacking. There was just a lot of crazy stuff going on. And, um, you know, as a lighting designer, um, and he also a sound engineer when I would create sound cues for theater, like, 
lighting is so much easier. Like it's difficult because you have to get up there, you have to move the lights, you have to figure out color scheme and everything else. But once you get all your cues patched in, you're good. You don't have to worry about a cue going awry or if something happens where a cue doesn't fire, it's usually because you didn't hit the button hard enough or you have to move the sliders a little bit quicker. But yeah, sound, it was like one of those things. So I actually had like literally three guys running sound trying to figure out what was going on and why certain mics weren't working, why it kept feedbacking, everything else. It was just, they kept doing it and it was like, oh gosh, but yep. So that's my story's gone wild, nothing. But I always say, sound's always tricky because <laughs> you could do absolutely nothing. No one could touch anything on that sound system and you could turn it on and something could go wrong because of, for a plethora of reasons. Uh, well, I um, was watching a friend of mine's live stream and he was talking, the, the pastor got up to preach and they were talking about my friend who's the worship leader there and how um, they came in to do rehearsal on a Sunday. This was a couple of weeks ago and um, they had their midweek rehearsal. Everything was fine. And then Sunday morning, it was like the soundboard just fried and it was just something went crazy and they had to like figure everything out on the fly and it, and you know, ultimately ended up working, but like, to your point, <laughs> the sound stuff, man, as it's, has a mind of its own. And then you think live stream too, right? Like if you have a separate mix and you have that mix online and you have, you know, it's not as easy as people portray it out to be. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So today's, um, so today's topic, we're going to be talking about, you know, discipling teenagers uh, because I think, when we get to, I feel like there's there's always, um, when you look at the life of the church, especially as people, with kids, you have your certain kids' discipleship, you have your Sunday school, um, and, and for the most part, that's like the primary discipling thing is Sunday school for children. Um, it's on Sunday mornings, you're there. You know, if you're a church that, you know, your kids don't sit in the service, they just automatically go straight to their classroom. There's that for those who they have kids sit in the service and then they leave halfway through the service to go to like a children's church or you have your own separate Sunday school programming. There's a lot of options for kids, younger elementary school kids to be discipled. When you become an adult, you know, you can go to Bible study, you participate in church, um, you can participate in like a life group or a small group within someone's home. There's a lot of things that you can do to kind of help yourself with discipleship um, as an adult. But when you get to teenagers, it seems to be a little bit different um, because there's always a lot of things that's going on in a teenager's life that tends to have challenges for pastors to be able to effectively engage and disciple that age group um i'm a part of a lot of different like groups um whether they're like things from like download youth ministry or i know there's like a couple of like youth group pages for youth leaders and i'd probably think about every probably at least maybe twice or three times a month someone's asking a question about how What's a great curriculum to really help engage my students? How do you disciple kids? How do you do this? And it's always has to do with programming, discipleship programming for teens. And it's always, always about that. Even what are some fun games to do? And I feel like, and Mike, I don't know if you agree or disagree, but I feel like when you look at a continuum, when people approach youth ministry, it's always fun and games, is primary is your primary thing and then you have like a little section of like biblical bible study like a little thing of a devotional here versus it's all about the bible we're going to study the bible we're going to do big bible things and then occasionally we'll do a little fun games it's almost like the fun in the bible are always fluctuating either a lot of fun or a lot of bible and then you have little fun little bible um, so, I mean, 
So we'll just kind of go from right there, Micah, and just kind of ask the question, you know, what are some challenges that you think on why it's so hard to disciple teenagers? Um, <laughs> you say, I mean, <laughs> I, I held up myself then uh, for the audio listeners. Um, it's the, the attention span, right? Like I was talking, my in-laws came over on Saturday and we were, you know, kind of talking about, he was talking about, uh, Marty, my father, and I was talking about a, um, video that he caught recently on, on YouTube. And it's, it's, uh, it was like the Joe Rogan podcast. And he was talking about, he was talking with a, uh, licensed therapist and, and they were talking about how this Gen Z generation is just so freaking smart. Right. And they have every, um, literally everything at their fingertips, smartphone, tablets, computers. Um, and I will, I'll say too, as somebody who just completed a master's program, like school was a whole lot easier just with the assistance of technology. Um, I don't know if you would agree with, with, you know, doing your doctorate now. Um, but like we, <clears throat> we have a, a short attention span in America, especially with, with, cell phones and, and smartphones and technology and basically everything does everything for us. And so uh, what my father-in-law was getting at was that like these kids are so smart and they're so talented, but yet they can't cognitively make a decision for themselves because technology has done everything for them for their entire lives. Um, I, I struggle with the idea because I'm a big proponent of technology and making life simpler but at the same time, if it's going to make your, you know, cognitive development not flourish as you get older, especially when, you know, in those prebubescent, did I say that right? Prebub, uh, <laughs> puberty. I, I, I know just, what you're saying. I know. What yeah. You're yeah. Saying. yeah. <laughs> puberty, like prebubescent years of like, you know, when you're, you're developing and you're becoming a young adult and, um, in respect to church, uh it's 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 kind of a hard balance and it's a hard sell and, and i think too that in the last couple of weeks in the different topics that you and i've covered over this on the show um we've talked about the unchurched so you know if you get a teenager that comes in who's never been in church in their life and they see things like oh we're gonna play dodgeball or oh we're gonna play kickball or oh we're gonna have video games or we're gonna play board games or video, whatever, right? That's a way to pull them in and get them engaged and connected. Um, but you have to know too that, oh, we're going to have a lesson where we, we, we talk about the gospel and um, all the churches that I've worked at where I've been involved in student ministry, we've there's been kind of a balance equally of each. And what I mean by that is that we, um, you know, we have open gym when, you know, before, uh, before you starts and then we have, um, if we go right into worship, we'll do a worship, uh, portion where the, I, I have been in both scenarios where the students will lead or I've led worship with a student band. Um, and then, you know, we pray. And we open up altars for prayer concerns and things like that and have a time of prayer. And then we have a lesson and the youth pastor will do a series or, you know, one-off messages similar to what you see in big church. Um, we call it big church, like regular church on Sunday mornings. Um, and then we have an altar call response time at the end. And then afterwards we, we have a snack and we have games. Um, now, that would fluctuate based on the time of year. Um, the order of that may change. We may do games and food first and then worship and teaching after, um, and then open gym at the end. Uh, it, it really just depends. And I don't think there's a wrong formula to do that, but at the same time, I think we have to focus heavily on the fact that like, Let's just say, Peter, your son's old enough to go to youth in, you know, a couple of years. And it's like, oh, he wants to bring his friend Bobby. And Bobby's never been to church in his life. But 
he's not going to understand worship and he's not going to understand prayer and teaching what's going on, but he's going to know what kickball is and he's going to know what, you know, board games are and, you know, food. Cause you know, we can all relate to having a meal together. So um, yeah, those are just, I mean, I, I, you know, I've done it that way. And then like uh, other churches I've worked at, like, depending on what time of year it is, like it may look a little different. Like in the summer, you may do quick devotion at the beginning, pray, and then we go out and we get ice cream or we pray together, have a quick devotion. And then we, uh, we go see a movie, you know, like it, it's it, Scott, it all comes back to your, um, what you were saying earlier about planning and how you plan. Um, I will say that I think things go a lot better when you have things planned out versus when you just throw it together. Oh, well, here's the thing. And I, I, I guess this is kind of like what my point is, why I think it's so hard is I think there's almost a disconnect. Like I agree with the technology thing. And, you mm-hmm. know, like, like even with my kids, like we, we, Laura and I limit their screen time. And then once screen time's done, it's like, okay, your screen time's done. And then it's almost like, what do I do now? They is there a, is there a meltdown when that happens? No, no meltdowns. The only time there's a meltdown is say, okay, turn it off now. Cause we got to go. And then like, what? Sure. Ah, like, but it's like, I gave you a warning and you weren't paying attention because you were so absorbed. Like, like we watched Inside Out this past weekend, and now my daughter has watched Inside Out on her tablet. Anytime she has screen time, she'll go and she'll watch Inside Out. Once it's done, she'll start the movie again. She's probably seen Inside Out at least three times, once as a mm-hmm. family and then twice just by herself. So it's like, okay. Like, that's fine, but... um. But I think the big thing of that is just kind of having that understanding of your teens and knowing that they are a lot smarter than what you give them credit for. Like you said, they, and not just like technological wise, but, you know, one of the things I remember working at camp was that when you worked with fifth and sixth graders or that age group, the one thing that the director at the time said is that, you know, the thing about fifth and sixth graders is they're going to be brutally honest with you. They're going to know if you are legit or they're going to know if you're a fraud, meaning by what you say, um, they're going to tell you if they don't like you, if they don't like you, they'll just flat out tell you they don't like you. And we'll go from there. Um, When you get to when you become a teenager, you know, they know things, but they at least have the thing where they're not going to be as blunt as like a fifth or sixth grader. They're going to basically, you know, if they don't like you, they'll be like, oh, you know, they'll tolerate you, but, you know, they're not really going to try to do anything more than than beyond what's required of them to put in effort into what you're doing or what you're teaching so a lot of times when it comes to doing effective discipleship with teens um the best thing to do is trying to really navigate how's the best way to be able to connect with my students because each student's going to be different. Your athletic student's going to be a lot different than your theater student. Um, so you have to kind of find like, well, what's one common thing that they don't want to do? Well, the one thing I've noticed with me teaching confirmation classes is that you ask them a question and it is dead silent. And I could pretty much easily burn an hour of just asking questions and waiting for a response. Until someone's brave enough to give me a response. Or I have the one kid who raises his hand all the time to give the response. It's like, I don't want to hear from you. I want to hear from everybody else in the room. So part of me was like, okay, what do I do so I can help? Because I know these kids have questions about the Bible. I know these kids have questions about the Christian faith. I know these kids have a lot of questions about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So how do I get that out? So instantly I said, okay. I made it a requirement. Here's what we talked about. Here's your homework. You each have to send me a question about Mm. based on your reading. Text it to me 
and then I will address those questions, and it's all anonymous. And every time when they had a question, the first thing I'd always say is, this is a great question. This is a great question. This is a great question. This is a really great question. And I always do that because I want to kind of model that your questions are 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 valued, are val are validated. And that if you're having a question, not only do you have that same question, but there's probably like eight other people in the room who probably have the same question. And I think what happens, and I think this is where we start to see a difference in like how leaders lead, is there's going to be people who are going to say, okay, text me a question. We're going to make it anonymous. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to answer it and kind of really build that up with my students where you may have somebody who will say, okay, we're not, we're not moving. We're not leaving this room until somebody asks me a question about what we read. And I want to have five different people ask me five different questions. And then people are forced to ask a question right there on the spot because they're like, well, we can't leave until we do it. And again, if, there, if there's someone who ha is like in sports and they know, hey, I need to get to soccer practice. And you have this person now basically holding us hostage to ask questions about the Bible. You know, you're going to have people ask questions. But I think in the moment, and either way you do it, you get the result. Kids are asking questions. But what is that doing long term for that student? Do they feel like, man, I can come here and I have the freedom to ask questions. I'm not going to be judged. I feel loved and respected for my ideas and for my questions. <laughs> or am I going to feel like, okay, every time when I come to church, I have to be ready to give a response. Whether I want to or not, I have to respond to something so that I can get out of here in time. And I feel like that's where we have the conflict is because a lot of times Leaders have their own way of thinking, well, this is the way I know what works, or this is the way that was modeled to me when I was a youth. So that I'm going to now carbon copy that to the next generation, and sometimes that may not necessarily work. That's a great point. I mean... I my wife always says, you know, she's comfortable with silence when she used to do youth ministry. And she's like, I'll, I'll wait. Like, you know, we'll, we'll wait till somebody answers the question. But um, something you just said to me, like, caught my attention where it's like, well, if we don't move to the next thing until somebody, you know, asks a question, we create that dialogue and we teach them you know, basic fundamentals of communication with one another, other than texting or Snapchat or Instagram or whatever it is, TikTok, like that's teaching them those basic fundamentals to, to communicate, right? With, with life. Um, I think of a great example. Uh, there's a restaurant in town that my wife and I go to a lot that we really enjoy. The food's good. Um, just a good community. We like, we just like it there, the food people, et cetera. They've got a bunch of teenagers that work at the front who serve as hostesses, hostesses or hosts, and they, you know, get people in their table and they just don't pay attention because they're on their phone or they're over here talking to their friends or they're doing this or they're doing that. And it's like, guys, it, <laughs> Your job is literally to greet people as they come in. But I think what it is, back to your point about communication and, and, and answering questions and stuff, is that they don't know how to, to communicate with people. And it, yeah. it, mm -hmm. it baffles me. Like um, when I've worked with students and even in higher ed who these, I mean, you're talking basically teenagers and youth ministry, but like even young adults who are college age, some of the college kids that I have worked with and I've had some awesome student workers over the years, it's like, they don't know how to answer the phone. They don't know how to welcome people as they walk in the door. You know, if they're, you know, walk-ins for the the office or they don't know how to, you know, do basic communication skills. Um, and it's like, well, where are they going to learn that? 
Yeah. Well, and I think that's a, and I think that's a, a very valid point because, you know, like, I mean, I mean, I've seen so much stuff where, especially when it comes to like job recruitment, like, I mean, think about the people who are, you're going to be your bosses are probably going to be, and I'm, I mean, you know, it depends on the company, but for the most part, you're going to have a bunch of bosses that are going to either still be um, Gen Xers where you're going to have millennials who are going to be kind of like your CEOs or your bosses. So, mm-hmm. and the thing is, is even though millennials kind of are in that weird dichotomy where they grew up, happen to talk on a regular phone. They know how to answer a phone. They know how to talk to people. They had to communicate. But then we started to see that technological boom, like right in the middle of like, kind of like those late nineties, you start getting a technological boom. So, you know, they kind of have the best of both worlds, right? They're kind of have one foot in, in the yesteryear and they have one foot on the digital path. Um, like yeah. when we went to, uh, in, at COSI, one of the science centers here in Columbus, there was a, called like a yesteryear where it's like these old towns. And I remember I took my son because my son had a field trip there. So I was a chaperone and I got on that, on that rotary phone and my son was asking me, how do I use this rotary phone? And the funny thing is, is I know how to use one because my grandmother had one. So I say, Oh, you do this. And I dialed one, which was that actually rang to a, to the pay phone down the street in this little thing. So when I dialed it, you could hear this phone ringing I'm like, Peter, why don't you go see who's 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 calling that phone? So my son picks up, goes, hello. I'm like, hey, Peter. And he's like, oh, wow. Like, he knew how to do that. But yeah, like, most students here today, the only way they knew how to communicate is through texting and through posting photos, emojis. So, you know, and a lot of times when you try to have a, com- and here's the thing, like, I had to, I was at a surprise birthday party for a parishioner at the church and the um, father asked me if I'd take his daughter home because their oldest son already left and they asked if I would take his daughter home. Now, for me, I'm like, um, maybe not because again, I'm a, you know, for me, it's more about safety thing. Like I'm a male and I have a young female in my car. Like, but the parents trust me. And for me, I don't put too much stock into that because I know I'm not going to do anything. And I clearly know this woman's not going to do anything. So, you know, I'm driving her back and I asked her, like, what some of the, you know, how do you feel confirmation is going? Because she's one of my confirmation students, too. And she was honest with me. I said, you could be as honest with me as you want. If you think, like, man, it sucks. It's great. And, you know, she says, you know, sometimes it's just hard for me to pay attention. Which makes sense because it is me trying to talk and me trying to get them to do something. And a lot of times with certain topics, the best way to learn is through asking questions and through answering questions or studying with other peers, like reading the scriptures together. That's the best way you learn. But if you have a group who doesn't know how to ask questions, then you're kind of in a, so you feel stuck. In some ways, and I and I and I don't envy the younger generation because uh, they don't really know how to ask good questions. You know, especially makes you now. wonder. Makes you wonder how they're going to, you know, doing an interview for a job, like you're saying. Well, and here's the thing: I think, but here's the thing: like you said, they're very smart, and so I think that if they're asked a question, like "Oh, how do you think you'll do?" they would be able to give you a very great response, but. I think the time is, is if you switch it, cause I know like a lot of times when you do interviews, there's always that time where, you know, like if I'm, like if I'm candidating for a church, I have these, the search committee asking me a million questions and then it's my turn. Then it will be my turn to ask questions. And I know exactly what questions I need to ask to make sure if this is going to be a good fit for me and my family or not. But I think a lot of times, like if I'm interviewing someone who's younger, and I ask them a question, I think they may hesitate or they may give me an answer, especially if it's one-on-one. If it's in a group, they're going to be embarrassed. But if it's one-on-one, I ask them a question, they're going to be upfront with me and they're going to answer it. And they're going to give me the most 
wise, brilliant answers. Even there's sometimes where I'll have a student say something to me and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is like the most brilliant thing I think I've ever heard. I don't know why it took me so many years to figure that out. Like you're a genius kid. Um, but then if I go, okay, ask me a question now about something. And it would be a lot difficult to answer that, to, to do that. Um, so I think there is that challenge. And I think as a leader, you have to understand that. And I think one of the things that I think is very helpful when it comes to discipleship is, you know, the attitudes that society has about different generations, especially younger generations, doesn't necessarily have to be ours. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've grew up in a church, and Micah, you probably might have, where I was told from a young age, youth are the future of the church. We're told that verbally, that we're the future of the church, but what is practice is not necessarily the case. I am told we're the future of the church, but then any time when there was something that happened in the church, like, oh, there's a stain on the carpet in the sanctuary. Oh, it must have been a youth who did that. Mm. We we have a we have a brand new like gymnasium, and you know, apparently there's a hole in the wall now because someone threw a basketball and it went through the drywall. Well, that had to be a youth. It could have been your men's basketball club who did that, but no, it's a youth. You know, so we were told we're the future, but then what was modeled to us is that we're problems. And I think even now, <laughs> even now as we get older, as some of us, some of us young people who believe that the we're the future of the church and we go in the ministry, and then we get in the ministry, and all we're being told is, well, you don't know anything. Um even people go to seminary, it's like, well, you don't know anything, even though you went to seminary and you studied the Bible, because you just don't, you don't preach the way that the old timey people preach. You don't do things the way, you know, you, you, you don't do things like Billy Graham did them, or, you know, you get compared to <laughs> Billy Graham. It's like, well, I'm not Billy Graham. Like, there's only one Billy Graham. Like, even his own kids can't live up to his own father's legacy. Like, so... With that being said, how we, if you see your teens as brilliant and wonderful and loving and are, and are somebody that Jesus cared so much for that he died on the cross for their sins for, then that's what we need to model. If you truly believe that your kids are great and that they're wonderful, then you need to make sure that they're great and wonderful. And even if you fall short, even if you mess up and you may have put, disciplined a kid harshly or you embarrass the kid in front of everybody or whatever the case may be, are you willing to practice the Christian values that you believe to humble yourselves and go and make that right? Even though you may be an, an adult and you may be in a p position of authority and you may have been justified in every single way to say, hey, I was justified in every single way to discipline you, but you saw how much that hurt that student and how they no longer want to come back to church anymore or be part of youth group or they no longer have that, you know, before they come to you and they talk to you about everything. Now they're not even talking to you at all. Like, are you able to model those Christian ethics that you believe in? to apologize and humble yourself and apologize to that student to kind of build up that rec and to practice reconciliation or be part of that ministry of reconciliation. I think those are things that, um, I think those are things that are going to be key when it comes to discipling kids. Cause if you can model, if you're teaching something in the Bible and you can model that for them in real life, it's good. They're going to connect with it in a bigger way because they're actually experiencing it. Yeah. Um, another thing I'm thinking about is like listening. Like, what what are these like? What are these kids thinking? Right? Like, you want to hear from them, and they don't want to respond to things yet. 
sometimes it feels like they don't or we don't listen and maybe that's why they're not responding you know to kind of re reiterate your point about you know how many times have i heard that over the years the teens are the future of the church well now we're adults and our generation is struggling more than ever um And then you got us, millennials, that are stuck in the middle between the old boomers and the old folks and then the younger kids coming up. And it's like, well, how are we supposed to navigate? <laughs> well, and see, it's funny. But I mean, if you talk about it, but if you said that to a Gen Xer, they'd be like, oh, you millennials. <laughs> sure. You've had the whole world handed to you. And I, and I get it. And I, I understand from as an elder millennial who kind of, some uh, identifies more with the with the Gen Xers than I do necessarily with millennials. Like, um, it's hard. It's it's really hard, and I think a lot of times, you know, like I don't know. Like, I think it's hard because I feel like a lot of times as leaders we try to build ourselves up as the spiritual know-alls you know what you know what i mean like um and i think a lot of that just because it's what's been modeled like you know if you have a youth pastor who's always like i'm in a position of authority so i'm the person that you need to listen to and i demand your respect then that's kind of um i think in some ways that's kind of challenging um, and yeah. I don't think that really works well with these students because I think a lot of times these students really want to spend time with you. And what I mean by that is because the students – quality time is one of those things that I think is a lost art in some ways. And and here's what I, what I mean by that. Because I feel like with millennial parents – and maybe even some of your later Gen Xers. With the grow gold technology, we see our kids with their faces and screens all the time. But what was, why are they doing that? And what was modeled to them? Well, imagine mom and dad flipping through their phone, checking emails, and your daughter, who's eight, comes up to you because she wants to ask you a question about where do cotton candy fairies come from? And you just continue to ignore her or push her away. Go, sorry, I'm busy right now. Bye. Um, and I think a lot of times when our faces are in phones as adults, that gets passed on to our kids. And I think as adults, when my kid, again, like if I'm looking at my phone and my kid comes up and he's asked me a question, I'll say, hold on real quick. Let me finish sending out this email. And then after that, I turn off my phone and I look at them and I go, okay, what do you need to ask me? And I'll have them ask me something. And I can't really judge everyone's, all my teens' parents because I don't know what their home situation's like. You could probably have the most loving parents in the world who would give anything for you, who will pay for all your field trips, all your sports gear, everything, so you don't even have to fundraise. But are you spending quality time with your student? Are you getting to know them? Are you asking them questions? And I think one of the interesting things I've been seeing mo recently, especially in the last year, is I have a lot of kids who are involved in sports. And again, it's not just like when I was in sports where I play a game for an hour and I come back home. It's I get up Saturday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, get my stuff on, I go to the field, I warm up, I play a game, and I play another game. I play like three, four, five games. Or maybe I play two games, but I play one game in the morning, and then I'm sitting there for five hours warming up, practicing before my next game in the afternoon. And by the time I get home in the evening, Saturday evening, my body is done. I'm exhausted, mentally exhausted, physically exhausted. So then Sunday rolls around, and parents go, hey, it's time to go to church. And that kid's like, I'm sore. I, go. I can't. I can't even move my body. I hurt all over. 
my body sore, I'm fatigued. So a lot of times these parents don't even like it's interesting because I will have students who will come to my Sunday evening youth gatherings and I will never see them on a Sunday morning. Yeah. And it's not, and again, and I'm not saying like, I know like, you know, generations, you know, an older, an older minister may be like, well, those parents, how come they're not bringing their kids to church? And for me, I kind of understand. I go, I understand. Cause when I would play games on, when I play rugby games on Saturday, I was sore when I had to go up and preach Sunday morning. And there are days where it's like, do I really need to go to church and preach? Can I just say, hey, I need to take a day off. But I know if I said, hey, I, can I take a day off because I'm sore, I'm bruised from playing rugby, that's not a good enough valid excuse for me not to go in on Sunday morning. And I don't want to lie and say I'm sick. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, so I kind of understand a little bit, but at the same time, being part of a Christian community is vital and it is important. And I think either A, either parents have to say, I don't care if you're tired, you got to come to church and you're going to youth group. And that's another full big, at least for me, that's another big full Sunday thing because I can't even get, because that's when I can get at least the majority of my students to come to a youth thing is on Sunday evenings. Yeah. Or... Or the church has to figure out a way, how can we engage these families with teenagers that's not necessarily on a Sunday morning? Is it possible for us to do a Saturday evening service where you know kids are just getting off games and before they go to bed, they can come, they can have a worship before their body starts aching them the next day? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't, I really don't know what the solution is, but as far as like, when it comes to discipleship, it really boils down to, are you practicing what you're preaching? And are you actually getting to know your students? And are you trying to figure out ways from that generation to really engage with them in different ways that they're able to respond to versus the way you want them respond because you're used to a certain way. Cause this is the way you did things or this is the way it was modeled to you when you were in youth group 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. I think we just have to be adaptable. Oh yeah. I mean, that's all there is to it. And I think a lot of times when it with adaptability, it's not necessarily leaders, but I think sometimes it's parents too. You know what I mean? Cause and and here and I'll say this to kind of close out because I know a lot of times, but I guess one of the biggest things I always hear from youth leaders is sometimes they could adapt, they could switch things, they could just be the most open, easygoing people to try to get people to come to youth events, whether it's a whether it's a Bible study or whether it's a pro, a, a program like coming to a concert or whatnot. You could be so adaptable and give every single option available to these students to participate. But at the end of the day, is the parent going to say, hey, I think you should do this because this is important. I mean, I had what we had a concert. I had one kid who wanted to go. And he was very excited to go. And then his dad talked to me. And he said, hey, I'm telling my son not to go because A, he's going to help me help his grandparents because my their brakes went on their car, so we're going to replace them, and I really need his help. Now, I'm not upset that father pulled that kid and said, hey, sorry, you can't go to this concert because you got to help me help Papa Nana's brakes. To me, I feel like this kid was involved in the musical. He's involved in so much stuff and youth stuff this week for this musical. And even though the concert was a fun thing to do, to have fun, you know, Dad needed him to help out a parent. And I and I understand that. And I'm and I'm not, but I think there's other parents who they say, I want my child to have a strong, loving relationship with Jesus Christ like I did when I was a teen. And I want you to hear that phrasing like I did when I was a teen. And then you go. And yet, anytime when there's an opportunity for that kid to come to Sunday morning church, anytime when there's an opportunity for that kid to come to youth group, they say, well, you can't go because you have 
this practice. You cannot go because you had a game Saturday and you don't want to go. So we're just going to say, okay, you know, we're not going to force you. And I understand. And again, I understand the parents plight too. I had one gentleman who he made it a choice for his daughters. If they want to come to church, not because when he was a kid, his parents forced them to go to church every single Sunday. And not only that, but he came every single Sunday. And then once he became a, when he went to college, he never went to church for years. And then eventually he came back to it. And I don't know if that's because he was so used to going, even though he was forced, he was used to coming every single Sunday that eventually when he started to feel like his life was kind of becoming unhinged. Well, the one place that I felt like I was secure, the one place where I felt like my life was together was when I was in church. Yeah. And even though we hate forcing our kids to go do anything, like I know my son said he wanted to do CrossFit. I signed up for CrossFit. He's been doing it for five weeks. And now he's like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. And it's like, buddy, you have to do something. Because if you don't do anything, you're just going to be on your tablet or your screen. Or you're just going to sit around the house all day. And I want you to go out and do something that's physically good for you. And it's a community-based thing. So for me, I think it's going to be challenging. I think it's not only challenging because of the type of parents we have, because they may be the parents were forced to go to church and they don't want to see that with their kids, but yet they still want the same quality. They still want the faith, same faith development for their kids. And it's one of those things where it's like a double edged sword sometimes like, well, if you want that same quality, you have to bring them to church. And I know sometimes it's going to seem like you have to pull teeth to get them to get out of bed. But you kind of have to model that. And you got to have to say, this is important. This is what we do as a family. This is important for us as a family. And if you don't make that a priority as a family, for you to come to church every single Sunday and be part of a gathering community or to have your kids come to a program, church programming, then there's nothing more you can do. So, so for leaders who are trying your best, you have to remember that you could love your students very well. You could do everything. But if your parents, but you may have some parents who they just may not have those same values as you do. And that's just an obstacle that you have to kind of figure out and adapt to as well. And that's why I always say, if you can get the parents involved, you're going to get your students involved. And I find that to be true 98% of the time. If you can get the parents involved, you will get your students involved. Or if you can get your students involved, deeply then the parents are going to follow suit so it's kind of one of those like pulling the rope things you just have to keep pulling it until you finally get to the end result that you want when it comes to discipling um, teens or especially of uh, families of teens as well any final th thoughts from you micah uh no i think you know that i just the one thing i i, I would say is that like something you said earlier in respect to like, I was expected to be at church every week. I was a pastor's kid. Yeah. Right. And so like, now that I'm older and I'm not currently serving in a church, it's like, wow, some Sundays I can watch it online or I don't <laughs> go. Right. Like it's, it's, as somebody who's not serving in the church currently, like it's nice to have that option, but like, uh, I, I, you know, I don't have much other to say than that, except for the fact that, like, for some people, the church is their whole life, and that's all they know. And back to the conversation with the end church, people don't always go to church, and they don't mm -hmm. really know what's expected of them. And so there are other worldly things like sports and uh, activities, and parents need them, and, you know, parents don't go to church, and, you know, so... I think it's just being willing to have that conversation and, and knowing that there needs to be some flexibility there and church may not look the same as it did 20, 34 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Well, friends, thank you so much for listening. And if you're a youth leader or, or a pastor and you're trying to figure out how do I engage with the younger generation, hopefully this was helpful to you. And hopefully this gave you a lot of wisdom. Um, at the same time, if you like this podcast or you like any of our podcasts, 
feel free to give us a five-star rating. Um, you can actually sponsor the podcast through our uh, Kofi page. There's more about that in the link in the, in the description. And again, we thank you so much for supporting us for all these years. And uh, we can't wait to be back on next week with another episode. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Scott Simmons Podcast. The Scott Simmons Podcast is made possible by support from our listeners. We thank listeners like Patty and Scott, whose support goes to this podcast's continual growth and maintenance. If you want to support this podcast, you can do so in a number of ways. First, feel free to give us a five-star rating if you enjoyed this episode and share it with your friends. If you'd like to financially support the Scott Seven Podcast, you can go to the website ko-fi.com slash the Scott Seven Podcast. That website again is ko-fi.com slash the Scott Seven Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.